Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. This is Lecture 5 of Week 4. We're going to be moving from our discussion of retention time into a discussion of peak widths. How do chromatography peaks get broad and why, and what can we do about it? Peak widths matter a lot in chromatography. One of the most important things you do in chromatography is you separate things. So as you can see below in this chromatogram, there's a lot of different peaks that are coming off this column, and it's a really, really pretty good separation. So you can distinguish peaks from each other. But you can imagine if these were much broader peaks, you might have to see a whole mass of stuff and not actually know the individual components present in this particular mixture. So you start a chromatography separation by injecting into this flow a bolus of material. And that material then moves through the column, as we talked about before, interacting with it, slowing down perhaps. But what it's also doing is have, taking up a finite amount of both linear space and space and time as it moves through the column. So if we were to take a snapshot at the beginning, it would be a Gaussian distribution with a certain width, reflecting how we injected it into the column. But as it started to move through the separation, it's going to broaden. So at one minute, it might be broader. And of course, because the entire concentration has to always be the same, the integral under this curve has to be equal to where we start. So it also gets smaller. At 10 minutes, even smaller. At 100 minutes, even more. So as peaks move through the column, they're broadening due to diffusion. So I'm going to quickly, very quickly, show you the diffusion equation and briefly try to at least give you a sense of where some of these formulas are coming from. So in order to understand diffusion, you have to solve something basically called the diffusion equation, which is pretty much a mass balance equation that describes if you have a certain group of molecules in one part of space, they're going to be driven to actually diffuse because there's a concentration gradient that actually costs a thermodynamic price. So it's the mixing idea, right? If you um, had, uh, I don't know, a puff of smoke in the air, it wouldn't just stay there, it would diffuse. And that's because substances want to not have one concentration in one place and zero concentration somewhere else. They want to mix. And that mixing is described by this diffusion equation, which basically says it's going to do what it can to diffuse out. And so this equation um, basically describes the flux, which is how much material moves through a certain area per time. and it is a differential equation, which we're certainly not going to solve in this class. But when you solve this equation, what you can find is a very nice solution. Shazam, we've solved it. And that solution is that of a Gaussian. And a Gaussian distribution we've seen a lot. And it's just uh, e to the minus x squared over a constant, which is related to the width. And that's describing the concentration of our substance as a function of x, so in space. So if you were to plot it this way, the peak says, I have a lot of my stuff here, but not here or here. So it's not really in time yet, but I think you can see that as a function of time, it's also broadening. So it has two parameters, both x and t, space and time. In any case, this is the functional form of this. What I really want you to focus on, though, is the width. So whenever you have a Gaussian, the width is given by what's in the exponential on the bottom underneath x squared. And that width is related to the standard deviation of the Gaussian, or the variance, which is that standard deviation squared. And so 2 sigma squared is going to be equal to 4 dt. And that's just from the fundamental definition of what a Gaussian is. So we can then take the square root of both sides and find that we can relate the standard deviation of a peak moving through this chromatography column to its diffusion constant, or d, which is a measure of how rapidly it moves. Now, the diffusion constant depends on a lot of things. It depends on the mass of the molecule. It also depends on the mobile phase, what other stuff is around the molecule. And so it's a really important parameter to, to understand. You don't actually use it a lot when you do these calculations, but you need to conceptually grasp that bigger molecules were going to have slower diffusion constants. So that means they're not going to spread out as fast as a lighter molecule. So you can convert this standard deviation, which is now in terms of time, to also the flow rate or the velocity. We haven't talked a lot about it. It's pretty straightforward. You know, if you're driving your car 60 miles an hour and you're going 120 miles, it's going to take you two hours to get there. So if you understood that calculation, you can pretty much go between velocity, how long of your column is, and how much time it took. 
In any case, you can see that we have time in this particular equation, and you can transform it to the flow rate, which is just u sub x, which is how rapidly things are moving through the column. And so what this tells us is that the, the width of a peak is going to depend on the time, how long it's been in the column, and it's going to go with the square root of that time. It's also going to go, obviously, with the square root of the length of the column. The longer the column, the more time you're in it. And because it's a square root, if you were there for 100 times longer in one separation than another, your, very, your standard deviation would be 10 times larger. So I want to introduce you. This is a quick slide. There's a certain nomenclature to peak widths. We've been talking a lot about sigma, the standard deviation. But it's hard to measure the standard deviation from a chromatographic um, uh, separation unless you fit the data. So there's some other more common ways of measuring peak widths that you can convert to sigma. Ultimately, you're going to want variance, which is sigma squared. So some important ones are the full width half max, which is kind of in the definition of the term. And that's going to be equal to 2.35 sigma. So if somebody gives you a w to the 1 half, you can easily convert it to sigma. Another really common is called the base width, which is the width at the base described as here. And that's just equal to 4 sigma. So keep in mind that if you're given data, and you have to analyze it by hand, you'll probably use a full width half max or a base width approach rather than getting the true sigma. And you have to convert to the sigma to use a lot of the formulas that I'm going to be showing you. Two notes about this. First off, this axis can be time or it can be volume. And that can be important to, to it can sometimes be confusing in some problems if you have the retention times. We're not really, I'm trying to keep you away from thinking about retention volumes, but you may come up against that if you apply this knowledge, and you can convert them very easily. Also, a double note is that sigma squared is the variance of the peak, and that's going to be a really important parameter for us to think about, um, because it's going to be important in our definition of something called the plate height. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the peak widths, how they broaden in time, and that broadening is going to be the square root of 2 times the diffusion constant of the molecule, actually the differential in the mobile and the, the stationary phase, times the time. But one thing I want to have you recognize is that depending on how the separation is designed, that diffusion constant can be different. You might have different temperature. You might have a different mobile phase. Additionally, you could be running at different kinds of flow rates. So it's possible you could have a good chromatographic separation and a bad chromatographic separation. So in a good chromatographic separation, let's think about what happens. It means that that peak gets basically smaller and broader with time, but you can still detect it even after 100 minutes. A bad chromatographic separation, the peak broadens and goes away very fast. And so one of the things we have to be able to characterize about any separation we do, and by that I mean the choice of the column, the choice of the mobile phase, the choice of the flow rate, is how good are those sets of choices in some uh, universal unit. And that is going to be um, something called the plate height. But before we get there, I want you to sort of look at this graph here, which more or less captures what I just showed you. So we've got two different separations here, a blue one and a red one. As the blue one is going on in time, you see the variance increasing. That's the y-axis. But it's not increasing that much. And the red one is a much worse separation. As it's moving through the column, its variance is increasing a lot. So the blue one is the good separation, and the red one is the bad one. But how do we grade them? Well, we can use the slope of sigma squared over L. Sigma squared over L is actually a constant with time. It doesn't change. And so if we use that as a characteristic, we don't have to sort of capture how broad is it after two minutes. We can say for this column, this is how it broadens as a function of time, or this is the constant of the broadening. And so you can assume in the blue separation, it's better than in the red separation. And its plate height, which is the sigma squared over L term, as you're going to see, is better. So one of the things you want is a separation that very, very, the, the broadening with time happens very slowly. And that's going to be because things like the diffusion has been minimized through some set of choices you've made. So the width of a peak always grows as it moves through a column. It's hard to really do anything about that. And its variance and its position also, of course, depend linearly on time. So what that means is if you divide the two, you're going to get a constant. And we're going to use the term plate height 
to capture sigma squared over L or this proportionality constant of a column. And one of the important ideas about plate height is you want it to be small. If the plate height is small, that's the slope of how the width is changing as a function of time in the column. That means you're not going to get a lot of broadening as you move it through a column. So plate height small is good. It's a really weird and strange unit. Um, and you can sort of read here a definition. But one of the first definitions I'm going to give you is it's equal to the variance of a peak divided by the column length. And it's very important that you express that variance, of course, when you measure it in terms of the same units. So ideally, sigma squared would be expressed in terms of uh, length. And you're going to get that from a chromatographic separation. Remember, if you've measured it in time, you can convert it to length if you know the flow rate. So just keep that in mind when you do these calculations. So just to reiterate, small plate height, if h is tiny, it has units of distance, it's gonna have, we're going to have narrow peaks and better separations. So a little bit more work on what is plate height really. So by setting it equal to sigma squared over L, I just want to take you through another derivation so you can see it another way. Remember that sigma is equal to the square root of 2dt. And so if we follow this analysis through, what you can prove to yourself is that h is the proportionality constant 2 times the diffusion constant over the flow rate. So we have another expression for plate height. That is, h is equal to 2 times the diffusion constant over the flow rate. Now, we're not going to usually use this because diffusion constants are, particularly in the separation itself, kind of hard to know. But conceptually, if you want to make h small, this gives you some ideas for how to do it. So, for example, if you wanted to make h small, you could lower the diffusion constant, make it less diffusive through some choice. That might be going to lower temperatures, for example. It might be changing the mobile phase. So you keep, you know, if your mobile phase is really big, your diffusion is actually going to be smaller for the molecule because it's a differential. Because for a molecule to move, it has to push other molecules out of the way. So if your analyte has to diffuse, it has to diffuse into a mobile phase that's got a lot of other atoms. So if you change those atoms, you can actually affect diffusion. You can also obviously affect it through the flow rate. If you run a faster separation, you'll spend a lot less time in the column. So all of those are factors that you can use to try to minimize your plate height and get really good separations. This is a chart that we'll be seeing in the next couple of mini lectures where I'm basically laying in some of the foundational equations that you're going to need to calculate things like plate height and as you'll see in the next lecture, the number of equivalent plates. So I hope you've had, a, had some introduction to the idea of peak broadening and chromatography, how it's related to diffusion, and how we use a unit called plate height, which is equal to the variance of the peak divided by the length of the column to give us a sense of is it a good separation or a bad separation, keeping in mind we want plate heights to be small for, of course, the best separation. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.